Okay, welcome everyone to Spine Conference. Thanks for coming. And um, like always, if you if you have any questions, just in, just interrupt me anytime. If you have any comments, just it's a we all can learn from each other. And today we're going to go over acute low back pain, which is a real common problem and very vexing. So just. David said this looks more like a sneeze to him than pain. And okay, I'll give him that. It does look a little bit like a sneeze. But, so what is pain? So pain's an unpleasant, the definition in the, in the dictionary for words is un, an unpleasant sensation occurring in varying degrees of severity as a consequence of injury, disease, or an emotional disorder. So it makes sense, right? If, you're, if your boyfriend breaks up with you, you're in a lot of pain, although there's no injury but you do have a lot of pain um, if you hit your thumb with a hammer that's very painful and you can also have a disease who can think of a disease that causes pain a disease process cancer. shingles Shing uh, shingles is horribly painful yeah or cancer yeah so the the pain definition from pain societies is very similar a little more complicated an internal and personal phenomenon consisting of an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience. So it's not just uh, a sensory, but also the, the experience is emotional. This experience is associated with actual or potential tissue damage or described in terms of such. So in terms of such damage. So it's a little bit complicated. But, but there's a couple things about this is that some pain feels good. So I'm not joking around here, but this is part of society. Is like this is a dominatrix. So some people, you know, with sadomasochism, they feel good with pain, and and you think to yourself, well, how could that be? So it's obviously extremely complicated that um, pain is also associated with emotions, and and it's translated inside of your brain. And the other thing is, like, see this little boy saying, I, the twins, and one's crying, one's not, I feel your pain, like Bill Clinton. Pain is personal, so no one else feels it. So if Aaron is in pain today, nobody else can feel that pain. It's just Aaron. So it's just a, it's just, it's a very personal thing that people feel individually. Now, we try to understand pain with these little scales to mark it so we can convey it. So, so since I'm the pr practitioner and you're the person feeling it, I have to somehow understand your pain. And it's really hard for one person to transmit to another person exactly how they're feeling. And we do our best with these, with just communication. But sometimes it's very difficult. So you may say, well, what, what is pain? Well, let's say you, you um, put your hand um, inadvertently on the frying pan, say, for example, and you, ouch, what is that? So it's very hot. Uh, there, we have no susceptors of nerve endings in our fingertip. It runs up the nerve. It goes into the uh, dorsal um, part of the uh, nerve root. It gets the first area where it stops is the dorsal root ganglion. Remember we saw one the other day in surgery, the little bulbous thing. So here, dorsal root ganglion, and there, it may go different routes, but it usually goes into the dorsal horn of the spine, spinal cord, runs up the spinal cord, and then it stops in the thalamus. And then from the thalamus, it goes up to the cortex where we experience it. So I saw Aaron's eyes. She's like, what is a thalamus? So here's the thalamus. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Here's the thalamus, uh, and it's uh, in your midbrain. And then from there, it goes into your cortex, and it's experienced. So the first person to first explain this was Descartes, who said that there's these nerve, these uh, highways that go up and down your body from when you put your foot into the fire and it goes all the way up to your spinal cord into your brain. So your foot in the fire, it goes up into the brain. But there are many places where it can be changed or altered. And in the cortex, it can be affected by your prior experiences, your attention, expectation, mood, anxiety, depression. All sorts of things can change it. So David, can you Maybe come up with a one time in your life when you had pain and you didn't feel it because of your brain was some something was, else was going on and you didn't feel the painful. Um, during the athletic contact sports. Football. Yeah. Right. So you're playing football. You're the linebacker. Yeah. If you're doing well, you don't feel. It. <laughs> you just made this if you're great. You're losing. You hurt a lot. <laughs> you're down 30 points. You went out. Right. You know. You right. get hurt. It's like I'm right. done. I'm going home. 
But if you just made the best tackle of the game and stopped the player, yeah. twisted your ankle, it's just a bruise. It's just a bruise. You keep playing. But then that night, usually you feel it. So now, like, low back pain is real common, right? Has, uh, has so there's only there's uh, five of us here. I've had an episode of very severe low back pain that hurt for days. Has anybody has anybody here not had an episode of low back pain? So uh, low back pain is really really common as human beings. Okay, so you may say why? This is my personal theory is that because we're upright creatures. So most creatures are on all fours. Very few creatures are upright and the ability for us to be upright to use our hands as a, as a uh, species allowed us to do things, like create things with our hands. But I think it has put a lot of undue stress on our lower back because we don't use our arms for uh, weight bearing. So I think we're at risk for this as human beings. Now you may say, well, where in the lower back? You know, where is the anatomy? Well, low back pain can come from any of these areas. It can come from the sacral iliac joint. It can come from the facets where the two bones come together. And in the front of the spine, it can come from discs. So there are many, many areas. So if you count the SI joints, that's one, two. I'm going to count the facets now. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. And I'm going to count the discs. Thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen. So there's eighteen places that can cause low back pain. All of these can cause severe low back pain, any one of them. So it's hard to know when you have low back pain where exactly it's coming from. It can come from even more areas than this. So what else? So you're going to say, well, what else can cause low back pain? Pregnancy can cause it. Pregnancy with labor, menstrual period can cause low back pain. A urinary tract infection, anything in your abdomen. What do you think is the most common presentation as a general surgeon, David, for low back pain that you used to see? Do you remember? I mean, other than the back disease itself? Yeah, other than the back disease, yeah. How about cholecystitis, yeah. pancreatitis, an aortic aneurysm, peptic ulcer disease, kidney stones, nephrolithiasis, pelvic inflammatory disease, diverticulitis, ankylosing spondylitis, the SI joint can be inflamed. I had a patient with hyperparathyroidism uh, that um, also had a concomitant lumbar disease, a fixed her, lump, fixed her lumbar spine, but she still had back pain afterwards, and I did more of a workup, like a bone scan, which showed... Uh, sacroiliitis and she had uh, hyperparathyroidism and depression so low back pain is uh, when it happens is very severe very incapacitating and when someone gets it they're really distressed because you're just you can't move so what do you do about low back pain so I uh, recently read this article from New Zealand um, which was a New Zealand guidelines group and it's basically a manual of how does a primary care physician take care of low back pain? So, low back pain by definition uh, is uh, less than three months. If it's more than three months, it's chronic. So it's acute low back pain. At 85% of the population at some point in time has severe low back pain. Um, billions of dollars are lost in work and it's one of the most common ailment. Headache is the most common neurologic ailment that goes, but low back pain is, is like second. So there are red flags to low back pain. So you may say, well, what's a red flag? Red flag is a serious, serious problem that needs to be addressed very quickly or something really bad is gonna to happen to the patient. So what are the red flags? So you get the red flags from evaluating the patient. Those are an intravenous drug abuser with low back pain and you have to consider a epidural abscess because if you inject into your skin, the bacteria can float through your body and cause infections in the spine. Um, pain at rest. So usually when it's a disc problem or a facet problem, it's pain when you move around. But if the person says, when I lay down at night, it's killing me, that's a serious problem. It could be uh, something that's not from a joint, like it could be a, a neurological compression or a tumor or something like that. Uh, Cauda equina syndrome, we'll get into that. History of cancer. So if someone has a history of cancer and has severe low back pain, it could be a recurrence <coughs> of the cancer or metastasis into the vertebral bodies and bones. Uh, an immunocompromised individual? Who could think of an immunocompromised individual? Like ca cancer patients are immunocompromised. What else? Like HIV positive. HIV positive, active HIV positive people, people on steroids, like somebody, um, people with rheumatoid arthritis, they're on immuno uh, drugs for that, biological drugs like Remicade. Uh, someone with a fever and low back pain, someone with a urinary tract infection with back pain, and someone with um, 
uh, weight weight loss and energy loss like um, uh, symptoms, which may be cancer. So these are just an examples. When you see examples, you tend to remember them. So this is a patient we saw last week, right, Aaron? So she had severe back pain. She had a history of a hilar mass, um, and she came to the ER several times, um, and eventually a workup of um, her MRI of her thoracic spine showed this tumor compressing her spinal cord. So here's the spinal cord at T4. The spinal cord should sit in the center of the spinal canal, but in her, the spinal, con the spinal cord was compressed from this big tumor that was hitting her spinal cord at the level of T4. This, this is the anatomy this shows you because it's not a great MRI. And this is the CAT scan which shows the, ero the destructive process of the same tumor. And interestingly, this patient presented with severe back pain. She said her whole back hurt. She couldn't tell us where. So we did an MRI of the entire spine, lumbar, thoracic, cervical, and brain, because she had a history of cancer to see where it was. And she also had said her left leg was horribly painful. She couldn't walk. And the bone scan was negative. We did a bone scan to make sure that there's no tumor in her femur or something like that. It was all negative. It was all coming from this thoracic tumor. So for this patient, it's a serious problem. And if it progressive, she could have, you know, developed a neurological spinal cord injury, which is a big problem. So we resected her last week, and she's doing really well. The other red flag is saddle anesthesia. So you may say, well, what is saddle anesthesia? So here's a saddle. So if you can imagine if for some crazy reason you painted the saddle, sat on it, and then looked where the paint is, that's saddle anesthesia. So you're numb in that area, in the saddle area. So what's the saddle area? The saddle area is the perineum. So the perineum is innervated by the sacral segments. And if your sacral segments, S1, S2, S3, S4, are numb, that can be from a, a, severe, spinal, a severe spinal canal lesion, which is compressing those sacral nerve roots. So you may say, well, what's the worst case scenario? Well, a numb perineum is, is a very big problem. First of all, you can't feel your uh, perineum when you have sex, which is like a disaster. Second is you can lose your bowel and bladder control, which is a disaster too because that means you don't have any control of that. Uh, and you know, socially, it's a disaster if you don't have control of that. So why do they call it quadriquina syndrome? Uh, because if you cut open the spine and look at the nerves in the lower back, it looks like a horse tail, which is quadriquina. And when these uh, nerve roots are compressed in the lower segment, sacral segments, you can get loss of your bowel bladder control from like a severe uh, um, injury. But sometimes, uh, patients don't present and say, I have caught Arquina syndrome. You know, they, they present in weird ways. And one common way that they present is um, I keep dribbling urine. Like, um, and you may say, well, what is that? Well, they have overflow incontinence. So their bladder's not working. Uh, and, and, um, and it's just, just overflowing and just going out. It's, it's dysfunctioning. So it's not like a outright loss of bowel bladder control. So they can present in weird ways. And if you do a bladder scan, they have a huge bladder. So you just have to have a uh, suspicion of what something's going on. And sometimes people don't present classically. They present in an unusual circumstance. So another red flag is an infection. This is like a disc space infection. So this is a real case of mine um, when I was here. It was a 66-year-old woman who had severe low back pain. And I was like, I was consulted for low back pain. And she was admitted for urosepsis. And um, she had E. coli in her blood and urine, and she was really claustrophobic. So the f doctors were, well, you know, we don't want to be mean to this uh, elderly woman and put her through the MRI scan. She, she refuses to go. We'll just get a CAT scan. It's almost as good. So here's a CAT scan, and it shows a really bad arthritic spine. See that? She's, she has uh, grade 2 spondylolisthesis. The disc is deteriorated, L4, L5 has stenosis. So what do you guys think? The low back pain is probably just coming from the arthritis, right? Yeah, obviously, I'm, I'm, I'm baiting you guys, right? It's coming from the arthritis, right? And that's it. Just, just treat her with some therapy and see how it goes. Well, I mean, she was uroseptic, so I was like, I, I can't rule out an abscess, although it's unlikely, it's possible. So we loaded her up on Valium, put her back in the MRI scanner, and sure enough, she had an epidural abscess. You can see it right here. So on top of this very arthritic uh, problem, she had an epidural abscess compressing her thecal sac. So here, see the abscess right here? And she also had severe stenosis on top of that. So it was a double whammy of, of severely stenotic spinal canal and a concomitant epidural abscess 
um, which um, uh, presented um, uh, with a urinary tract infection. And this kind of shows you where the abscess was. It was at L3, L4, and at L4, L5. So this is an emergency because the pus is compressing the uh, nerve roots in that area and it's a closed system so she can get a progressive neurological deficit. So I just did this decompression. It kind of shows you where I did the decompression. And she did extremely well. It was like a limited surgery just to, I didn't fix everything there, just to give some more, get the, get the pus out, and decompress the spinal canal. So other things that are red flags are fractures. So when you know somebody has a fracture, well if someone's involved in a motor vehicle crash, and the car's totaled, or they're, you know, serious car accident, you have to be suspicious when they come in with back pain that they have a fracture. But sometimes um, older people can present with occult fractures too. So this, this man came in, he was 75 years old, and he had severe back pain. This was his x-ray, which shows he's already had two kyphoplasty procedures. So you're like, well, what are you going to, I don't know, what's wrong? Well, maybe some arthritis. Well, the MRI scan showed a fracture. See, he has a new fracture. And it's very painful. You don't always need to de do a surgery for this. Um, you can just treat it with pain medicine, but he didn't want it. He wanted the kyphoplasty because the opiates weren't working. So I did a kyphoplasty, and then he presented three months later with, again, back pain. And this time, he had a new one at L4. So he kept fracturing his spine. And he had like, every level treated with cement. And he did very well with the cement. And I don't want you to think that I'm cement happy. I always give people the options. I was like, take some pain pills, have a corset, give it a little time. And he wanted none of that. He's like, I, I want the cement procedure. Um, so it's um, so. Any questions about that? So so what do you do when somebody comes in, a young person that comes in with low back pain, incapacitating, they're holding their back, they can barely walk, everybody's upset. Well, first thing is reassurance. So you tell them. The, the 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 probability is you're going to be fine. So something's wrong. I don't know where it is. You don't have any of these red flags, so I don't think it's a serious problem, and it's probably going to go away, and you're going to be fine. It's a very common human problem. You're going to be all right. You tell them the epidemiology. Everybody has them. You explain to them the anatomy, all these different discs and things, or facets, or sacral leg joint. They can be painful because we're upright creatures, and it goes away. The probability is you're going to be fine, and you talk to them about the course. It's going to take like two or six weeks, maybe a month, and you're going to be fine, and it's going to go away. So the mainstay of low back pain is non steroidal and inflammatory drugs. So there's like a million of them. My favorite one currently is meloxicam. It used to be naproxen, but I switched because meloxicam is once a day. But any, any of these are fine. And they decrease inflammation. So this is, a, this is a bad image, but this is an inflamed ankle. So inflammation is heat, redness, swelling, pain. So the non steroidal inflammatory drugs remove the infl inflammation in your whole body, but specifically we want it to work in the spine. So what's the whole treat? The whole point of this treatment for the low back pain? I tell people is to break a pain cycle. So the, what's a pain cycle? Well, I, I explain to people analogies. We always analogies really help us understand things. I I, I look at it as the um, parent who's been up all night with the crying baby. So the parent's been up all night. Baby will not sleep, crying constantly. You're walking. You haven't slept. Somebody walks in your house eight in the morning and you want to kill somebody, and and the person says, Whoa, what is your problem? And like you don't understand. I have been up all night with this baby, you know. And they're like, just here, let me take the take the baby, rest, and and give it an hour. So you go, you take a nap, and then you're fine. You go back to your baby, and even though the baby's fussy, whatever, you're okay. You don't want to kill somebody, but you can get into a pain cycle when you just you just absolutely lose your mind. So the same thing can happen with uh, pain. You get into a pain cycle where you're worried you're gonna you're going to get worse, then you don't move, and then you're just constantly stiff, then you get weak, and then mentally you, you feel that you can't do anything, and it just it keeps getting worse and worse and worse. So the, the goal of this treatment is to break the pain cycle. And also when you talk to people, just avoid things like bending over to lift something, extension exercise. What do you guys do in therapy for low back pain? I think we talk to them a lot about that cycle, especially after surgery, that you know a lot of them don't want to move. We explain to them that you need to move because then you have to deal with all these other issues if you don't move. A lot of times I think they're, they were in pain for so long, so they have like these certain behaviors that they've kind of been accustomed to, so we teach them at, you know, how to modify 
Oh, they're just normal activities, things to avoid. Mm -hmm. um, but I think a lot of it, too, is just kind of, be, you know, hoping they change their behavior a little mm -hmm. bit. Okay, so, so mm -hmm. okay, so moving around and mm -hmm. sit, sitting puts the most stress on the disc. So people with disc problems have severe pain with sitting. So there are also yellow flags. So have you guys ever heard of yellow flags? Mm -hmm. Okay, me neither. So this is what I learned from reading this New Zealand article. They're yellow flags for low back pain. So it's not a red flag; it's a yellow flag. So the yellow flags are psychosocial behaviors barriers to recovery, and they include a belief that the pain that the belief that pain and activity are harmful, sickness behaviors like you just lay in bed and you don't want to move, a lower negative mood, so, social withdrawal, um, uh, for I don't get, uh, problems with claims or compensation, workman's compensation claims, a history of low back pain uh, and time off and other claims in the past, problems at work, uh, poor job satisfaction, a very heavy, uh, heavy workload, unsociable hours, and an overprotective family and lack of support. So, I'm, I'm, I've seen every single one of these. We had one the other day. Remember when the uh, husband uh, went to the wife? Don't move! Don't don't move! And you have to talk to the spouse. It's like it, it's okay. They're they're going to be all right. Let them let them move. It's it's okay. So there's all these things. These are yellow flags for recovery. You've seen everybody's uh, seen it. Yes. Yeah, it's real common. <laughs> yeah, it's it's human. So what do you do with people with yellow flags? Well, it's the, re the same as uh, people that without as reassurance, and you have to make a plan for getting back to work, getting back to sports, getting back to their life. Not steroids, muscle relaxers. I added opiates. It wasn't in their article, but I added opiates because I feel opiates are reasonable as long as they're not overdone to break the pain cycle. Physical therapy, chiropractic manipulation, all these things help people go back to their lives. And people need a plan. So you speak to them about the plans of medications, relative rest, not bed rest, but you know, just take it easy. And I always do a, a blast off days. I was like, when do you think you can go back to work? And that puts it in their mind, I'm going back to work, I'm going back to my life, you know, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, everybody's different. But I make them make people make a plan. So they so when they have the plan, they usually do it. It's like a self fulfilling prophecy. We also I also discuss a worst case scenario plan. It's like okay, well worst case scenario we'll do this, get an MRI scan. Worst case scenario we'll do a surgery, but eventually you're going to be okay. And you have to follow up these people, see them back, so you make sure they're getting better, and uh, tell them what to look out for. So there's a couple things that you have to make sure people understand that pain doesn't mean there's damage. So the people, the, the, the patient says, you're so lackadaisical about this. Look at me, I'm, I'm horrible. Come on, it's like you just give me ibuprofen? I was like, look, just because you have pain doesn't mean you have a serious problem. I mean, I know it's very, very painful, but it's not cancer. You have to just put it into perspective. It's not cancer, I don't think it's a fracture. I don't think it's an infection. I don't think you're gonna go paralyzed. I think you just have a, like a disc problem. And even though it's incapacitating, it's gonna get better. You have to explain it that it's not this pain is not damage. So you have to explain to patients that this pain is not a danger sign, but it, and, and it, it helps people recover. So the pain is, is um, it can be modulated in the brain with a bunch of things like, you know, will it ever go away? Am I dying? Is, is this the end? Will I ever play baseball again? Things like that. And you have to help them understand it. And then it's modulated in their mind and it helps helps them heal basically and you have to avoid catastrophizing so it's a common condition in, in the human kind to catastrophize uh, and it comes from anxiety and everyone has some level of anxiety otherwise you would just run across the highway you know with wanton abandon and kill yourself so anxiety is something that helps us survive but it can get make you worse too you can catastrophize so I'll tell you how I catastrophize is when I get into the airplane, I was like, oh God, this thing is going to crash. You know, <laughs> that's, that's the way I could, but it's not going to crash. You're catastrophizing, okay? You're going to be all right. It's not, it's not going to happen. So how do you prevent these problems? Well, prevention is you have to check their problems, try to control their problems, try to, try to contain these, contain these behaviors. Um, you know, excessive pain behaviors, the sick role, inactivity syndromes, get people moving. Um, to try to avoid re-injuries, you know, like you said, uh, uh, lifting and uh, postures, try to avoid recurrences. Um, 
and try to avoid the long-term disability, try to avoid work loss. So the goal is to prevent loss of function uh, and keep people moving, um, decrease their distress, you know, and try to avoid the low mood. The low mood could be a serious problem. So emotions um, significantly impact people with low back pain. So we say emotions. Well, if they're in the middle of a, a lawsuit, I mean, it's a very, very stressful thing. It's very important to them. If they're unemployed, they can't, they lost their job, they can't support their family. Also, what kind of family structure they have. I mean, this this is the best case scenario where everybody's, you know, like Tolstoy said, all happy families are the same. All unhappy families are unhappy in their own way. So what's going on in their family? You know, what's going on in their lives? Did they just lose a brother or a mother? I mean, bereavement. And also the educational um, uh, level of the patient uh, does change their uh, understanding, you know, what's going on. So what psychosocial issues can affect the low back pain? Well, fear, anxiety, if there are financial problems, they're about to go bankrupt and they're losing their job, they're angry, depressed, they don't like their jobs at all, there's family issues, you know, their son is whatever, not listening to them or doing something bad, they're under stress, for different issues. So you have to understand when someone has pain, there's, there's three factors. There's the environment that they're under, there's the there's the uh, agent, which is what's causing the pain, and the host, the person himself, and they all interact with each other and try to understand these three things. So what's going on with the patient? So if it's cancer, that's a pretty bad agent. So you, that has to be surgically treated. Uh, the host, what kind of person is this? Is this like, you know, whatever, the high school quarterback, or is this, what kind of person is it? And then the environment, where is this person? You know, is this person unemployed? Is this person homeless? All these things uh, have an effect. So mood, mood is very bad too. So if someone has a low mood or is depressed, that can significantly ex uh, accentuate the low back pain. So depression by definition, um, you have to have five of these symptoms for at least two weeks. Now, actually there's a new one now, it's DSM-5. DSM but so this is just, we, we basically made this for you know research and for diagnostic purposes, but in general, all depressed people say, I'm bad, the world is bad, the future is bleak, and nothing gives me pleasure. So this is kind of like a simplified version because I'm an orthopedic surgeon, but all depressed people feel the same way. And that's, that's depression. So if you can, you can see that, that's a problem. And that's gonna be, it's going to be hard for them to get better if they're depressed. Um, now, one thing that's important is that as physicians, we always believe emotions. So, um, if someone comes in and says, I am so angry, well, you believe that that person's angry. That's like, no question, that, that guy's angry, okay? But when someone says that they're in pain, as physicians, we don't believe them. They're like, he's not in pain. We never believe it, right? That's like, that's like, a, it's like a problem that we have. And we have to understand that we have to, we have to believe the pain because it's real. And they wouldn't say it if they didn't feel it. So they do feel the pain. Now, what's the cause of the pain? I don't know. But as a physician, we have to believe that they're in pain. But what about the patient that says, like, you go in and, like, they've had back surgery and you say, okay, what's your pain score? And you know, like, the nurse has already medicated them because we want them really good before we go in and do therapy. And they're like, oh. Right. But they don't look like they're a nine out of Right, they're eating pain. breakfast, so yeah. they walk around. Yeah, yeah. They're chatting on their cell phone. Right. And, and they seem else, quite, they like, seem, oh, I'm a nine out of 10 pain. They seem they, quite comfortable, yeah, right? And, and then like, you have the other end of the spectrum where the guy comes in, the stoic guy, and he's like, oh, he's not moving. He's like, are you in pain? No, 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 just a little bit stiff just this a morning. Just yeah. <laughs> just a little bit stiff. Like, what? <laughs> Just a little stiff, it'll go away. I'm yeah. fine. I'll take Tylenol, I'll right. be all right. I'm all right, I don't, <laughs> I don't take pills. This is just, still will pass. And that guy's in horrible pain too, right? Yeah. So, so we're, I, no, I don't have no idea. I, I, I don't know how to deal with these things. But you have to believe what they say. So it's complicated. But you have to believe what people say. You have to believe that they're in pain. Okay, it's their best way. You, you have no idea what's going on in their head. Yeah. Like the two yeah. twins. Yeah. You have no idea. I mean, obviously, 
you're inferring from their other behaviors that if you were in such pain, you wouldn't be talking on your cell phone, you would be walking around and I mean, right. but still how they interpret pain is, is maybe different from other people or maybe they're super sensitive. You have to believe them. Okay, the other, the other things that influence processing, things that influence processing is, is um, focus, absorption and distraction. So when you process pain, like we talked about David, it's like the last, it's fourth down, you're in the Super Bowl, your ankle hurts a little bit. Like who's the Jim, Jimmy Smith? He had a bad ankle. Her ankle hurt, hurts a little bit, but he's gonna <laughs> stop that wide receiver from getting that touchdown, you know, come hell or high water. And he's focused and, and he doesn't feel any pain at all. So people's focus, or when you're playing baseball and you're just focused on that baseball, there's nothing else in your life but that baseball. So. What they're, what, if they're distracted by things, what's absorbing them, where is their focus? So if their focus is just their pain, I, personally, I think it's gonna make it worse. Right. Now if their focus is like, I gotta get it work, I can't, you know, I can't, do, I mean, they're gonna have a different level of pain too. So that affects um, low back pain. Another thing about the focus is that there's a gate theory. So there's only so many stimuli that can go to your brain. So what do you mean by that? Let's say let's say your shoes are too tight and it's causing you pain. Um, you're not going to feel like uh, someone punching you because you're, there, there's other nociceptors going into your spinal cord and then going up to your brain. And there's only so many pain signals that can go into your spinal cord and then up to your brain. So there's a gate theory. It's just as if all these painful stimuli are going into your spinal cord and there's a gate there and only one can go through to your brain. Does that make sense? So there's a gate theory. And I, I look at it as the Three Stooges getting through a gate. Remember, they always fight and they bump out and just one goes through. So you can have uh, multiple things in your life that may be distracting you or multi multiple painful things that are distracting you so that the painful condition, you don't feel it as much. For example, and that's why painful conditions, many people say it's worse when I lay down at night, then it's throbbing. Because during the day, you have all sorts of painful stimuli or stimuli, or not painful stimuli. So, and, and that distracts your your uh, brain from the painful condition. And uh, acupuncture may fit in here too. Exactly. Uh, the mild stimulation still blocks the gate, loads the gate. Exactly. And uh, therefore gives you some relief. And that's probably the way acupuncture works. Yeah. And, and it breaks the pain oh, cycle. It's not the Chinese diagrams with the uh, wing and wang and whatever. Yeah. Uh, well, well, it probably well, is well, actually a neurological function. Yeah, of course. So, and I think it breaks the pain cycle. So you're like, it's horrible, horrible low back pain. And all of a sudden you've got this needle pain, which is like a mild pain, and that breaks the pain cycle and then you're okay. So. Because once they take the pins out, the pins are gone. Maybe even stimulation is you don't uh, feel. The, the, the uh, needles are so fine, so small, you don't feel much, but there's they're still stimulation there. Yeah. You feel or something. They, or they also apply uh, elect, uh, electric... Like TENS uh, units. TENS units, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. Or yeah. massage. Yeah, based on the same mm -hmm. principle. Mm -hmm. that's, how, that's how I think it breaks the pain cycle. That's how I think it helps people with back mm -hmm. pain. So if you can just break the pain cycle, in other words, let the mother sleep for an hour, just relax, they're okay, they can deal with that painful problem again. Right. Okay, so another thing is always on my mind when people come through with low back pain is, is I don't want them to lose their job. Here's a guy that, when people lose their jobs, it's a serious problem. And there are, there are questions also that you can ask people to see if they have yellow flags or see what their thoughts are. Have you had time off in the past? Do you understand what's causing your pain? What are you expecting is going to help you? What is your employer saying for this? What are they thinking? What's your family's thinking? Coworkers, what are you going to do to cope with this pain? Uh, do you think you can go back to work? So it's important to have people be active versus passive. So people that are active in treating their pain do a lot better than people that are passive. They're like, this is not my problem. This is like your problem, doc. You got to fix this. So you want to the person to have an active role in the course of their disease. And, and the people that confront their problem, like the two rams button heads, are a lot better than the ostrich that puts his head in the sand and avoidance. So you wanna promote 
confrontational behaviors like I'm going to get back to work. I'm going to walk today. I'm going to get my motion back versus people that are avoiding is, oh, I'm not walking. I'm not going to work. I'm not going to. No, I'm not doing any of that. I'm, so the people that confront it do a lot better than the people that don't. And also the, the thought process is there is no cure for this problem. I mean, the human condition of suffering that's part of being a human being. There's always going to be pain in your life. That's that's life. There's no perfect world. This is like the like Kierkegaard said, there's all these bad things in the world, but this is the best possible world that God could have created. Out of all the all the different worlds he could have created, like the millions of worlds, this is as good as it gets. So you have to tell people this <laughs> your problem, your back is as good as it gets. You're human. So you have pain and it's going to go away. And when people think in those terms, they don't think like if they, they, they can deal with it better. Okay, so, so any questions going forwards? Okay, let's just keep moving. So can you predict um, who's going to have disabling low back pain? So this was a study in the British Journal of General Practice. So they asked patients um, uh, how frequently they have the pain, and, uh, and they uh, studied them active uh, active examples like staying busy, active distracting the attention from pain, taking part in physical therapy, and passive people saying, I wish my doctor would prescribe better pain medicine for me, or um, depending on others to help daily tasks, like, uh, dear, can you please uh, get me a cup of coffee? I can't move. Or that's me in the mornings. <laughs> and, uh, or this thinking is, I, I can't do a thing to stop this pain. There's no way anything, I can't do anything. So the people that are active do a lot better and heal better than the people that are passive. So another issue with low back pain is fear avoidance. So you're like, well, what is fear avoidance? This was um, described in a review study in 2000, and I've read this article several times and I really liked it. It came from Sweden. Um, that f patients that had a, a fear of pain. So there are people that don't have any fear of pain. So they're like, uh, so you can say, for example, is the, um, it's the weightlifter that benches like 350 pounds. It's like, this may tear my shoulder, but I don't care. I'm doing it. Versus the person like, I'm not bench pressing that. That may hurt me. So when patients have a fear of pain, they do a lot worse. So, so you may say, well, what, what does that mean? Well, you have an injury and you have a painful experience. If the patient has no fear at all, they confront their pain. They're like, oh, I'm getting back. I'm walking. What if they, and they recover. But the patients that have a fear of pain, they catastrophize. This may be from uh, a negative affect. It could be depressed, low mood, uh, and they have pain-related fear. They avoid things. They're hypervigilant of not moving. They get weak. They get more depressed. They get more disabled. They get more withdrawn, and it gets even worse. So fear avoidance is a very serious problem. So you have a painful problem. You're afraid of pain. You just lay in bed, watch uh, television, and you slowly become disabled. So this is something that you want to avoid, uh, fear avoidance. Okay, so this is kind of a break. So any questions about fear avoidance, low back pain? Okay, so I want to get into opiates a little bit because I use opiates and it's a very hot topic. So when patients come to my office, I give them opiates. I feel like if they're in terrible pain, it breaks pain cycles. But also it's kind of tricky because the opium can affect them as well. So I think withholding opiates, it's not fair because I, I, all, I, I see what the patient is like, do you think you need something stronger than this ibuprofen? And many people say, no, I'm, I think I'm fine. But other people are like, this is not working doc and I can't move. Well, I want the person to move. I want the person to break the pain cycle. I want them to confront their pain. So I think opiates are good. Um, they can be good, but they can be terrible. So you may say, well, what's going on? What's going on in society? What's new? Well, this was um, in the Wall Street Journal yesterday that um, 18 women die every single day in the United States from opiate overdose. So that's a lot. And 30 men uh, die every day from opiate overdose. And it's, it's really progressing a lot. It's gone up 400% since 1999. Uh, and so 400% more women are dying every day from opiate overdose um, uh, since 1999. Um, 
and for every uh, for every woman who dies of a prescription painkiller overdose, third to go to the ER for misuse or abuse. So it's a really serious problem. This just came from the CDC, just uh, published this in July 2013. So in our society, we we've got a serious problem with the prescription pain pills. So you, you may say, well, what what is opium? Well. Opium comes from the poppy plant, and you cut it, and there's a, a juice comes from it, and then you extract it from there. In 2008, there were 36,000 drug overdoses. Just to understand it, in the same year, there were 39,000 deaths from motor vehicle crashes. So a lot of people die from drug overdose. Most of the opium comes from uh, Afghanistan and Pakistan. Um, I'll just go with this. And, and morphine uh, is a natural uh, hormone. It's called endorphin in your body. Uh, and it's secreted in response to pain, st strenuous exercise, orgasms, or excitement. So it obviously, it's, it's a natural substance in your body that makes you feel good, makes you feel euphoric, and also helps with pain. So you may say, where did it come from? Well, it came from this, this German man, Friedrich Wilhelm Adam Sir Turner in 1804 was the first person to isolate the active ingredient associated uh, with the medicinal plant or herb uh, opium and he isolated morphine and he started selling it and he, and he named it after the uh, god of sleep Morpheus and uh, Merck in Germany in 1827 was selling it out of this shop he was the only person in 1857 they invented the hypodermic needle which allowed you to insert it in your veins so morphine for opium is always the gold standard. It's a natural substance from the uh, poppy plant. Uh, it's, it acts on your CNS. Um, it has many uh, uh, problems with gastric emptying, and peristalsis makes people um, constipated. Um, there's a dependency issue, psychological and physical. There's a tolerance issue. It's metabolized in the liver. Codeine is less potent than morphine. Uh, it was initially uh, invented in 1832 in France. It's the most widely used opiate in the world. Um, in some countries, you can get it over the counter. Like in Canada, you can get it over the counter. Yeah. Now, heroin uh, <laughs> was discovered in 1874 from morphine, and it was commercially available in 1898 in Bear. And it's one and a half to two times more potent than morphine. Uh, it's very lipid soluble, and it crosses the blood brain barrier very quickly. And that's what gives people the euphoria from morphine is. The quickness of action onto their brain. So if you get that to be very, very fast, the people feel severe, the people feel a great euphoria, and that's why heroin is extremely addictive. And it overtook morphine very quickly as a choice drug of abuse once it was available. But then it was taken off the market very quickly because people were obviously destroying themselves uh, from the addiction. Now Vicodin's the number one uh, prescription in the U.S. in 2010. There are 131 million prescriptions for Vicodin. 131 million prescriptions. I mean, can you imagine? And we're only a people of like, we're like 300 million people. So you can imagine how many people are prescribing Vicodins. So it's enough narcotic prescriptions to give every American one five milligram tablet every four hours around the clock for a month. That's how much prescriptions we, uh, Vicodins we give. And the street price is two bucks a pill. Now oxycodone, in 1998, the world production was 23,000 pounds. Uh, in 2007, it was 150,000 pounds. So from 1998 to 2007, that's a difference of seven times more oxycodone was made. So 150,000 pounds of oxycodone. So that's the same weight as 13 grown elephants. If you just put them on one side of the scale, that's how many oxycodone pills that we make in the world. Can you imagine like how many pills that is? Uh, and the United States, okay, consumes 82% of the world's oxycodone. So we, we Americans love oxycodone. Um, now, oxycontin is, is a long-acting um, uh, opiate made by Purdue Pharmaceutical. Um, um, and it's, um, it's another medication into this. Um, and Vicodin is basically hydrocodone. It's 50% as potent as morphine and analgesia, so it's not as strong. The serum half-life is about four hours. It's metabolized by the liver. It can decrease your testosterone. It can cause all sorts of complications. Uh, Dilaudid was first discovered in 1924, uh, and it's three to four times more potent than morphine. So the Dilaudid will be prescribed, Aaron, is like you know one 
very low dose compared to morphine. It's, it's very potent. And it, it also can give you a very powerful euphoria. So it can be very addictive. But uh, um, uh, withdrawals accelerating. It, um, so um, I won't get into the um, Controlled Substance Act, but we all know it's controlled. Now, uh, morphine withdrawal, just so you can understand, if you, I think if you understand it, you can deal with it better as a physician. After about 14 hours of no opium, you crave for the opium. You have anxiety, irritability, perspiration. They're sweaty. They're, um, um, they have dysphoric. After uh, 18 hours, they can they can sweat. The heavy perspiration. They can be mildly depressed. Uh, they can cry. Um, they get rhinorrhea, loss of appetite. In 24 to 36 hours, they have cramping, the muscle spasms, involuntary motion of their muscles, uh, and that's where kick the habit comes from. They have loose stools, diarrhea, insomnia. They can't sleep. Uh, they may have a slight fever. Uh, they um, uh, tachypnic. Um, they have tachycardic. Their heart's racing. Uh, at around 72 hours, uh, three days, uh, they can be in the fetal position. They can be vomiting, uh, frequent diarrhea. So basically, they feel uh, like they have a horrible flu. And the whole thing uh, can take around seven to 10 days, the withdrawal. Also, the psychological withdrawal, they get severely depressed, anxiety, insomnia, they can't sleep, they have mood swings, they have amnesia, they can't remember things, they have a low self-esteem, so, and they have paranoia. So, um, morphine withdrawal is like, it's a serious problem. And many people get it, a lot, many patients say, I, I, I went through withdrawal. So if you understand it, I think as a physician, you can deal with it better. Okay, so any questions about morphine? All right, so this is a new article from 2011, which I just read this morning, which is a review on opioid-induced hyperalgesia. So you're gonna say, well, what is this? This is a paradoxical response where, I mean, paradoxical in the sense like, you know, you wouldn't think this would happen, but when you keep getting more and more pain medicine, your pain gets worse. So you ever increasing dosages of pain medicine, and yet my pain's not going away. It's actually getting worse from the opium, and it's very common. So I, I like to use analogies because analogies people understand them. It's like alcohol. So this, these two guys, um, let's say they never drank beer in their lives, and this is their third beer, and they are just having a blast. Now this guy drinks every single day, and he's at his sixth beer, and he just has to drink just, just to feel right, and he's not drunk at all. So after a while, you develop a tolerance to medications, and it's very common. You can understand alcohol because most people have seen alcohol. And you, the same thing can happen with opium is you can develop a tolerance. Now a lot of this opioid-induced hyperalgesia has been um, studied with people on methadone maintenance. So people in society, instead of having people using IV drugs and killing themselves basically, they can have methadone, which keeps them from going through withdrawal uh, and uh, it's a more healthy lifestyle. And they've studied these methadone patients and they found that when you do a cold presser test, he's like, what is that? Well, you put someone's hand or foot into extremely cold water and you see how long it, they can keep it in there. It's, it's a test. People on methadone are extremely sensitive compared to people that are not on methadone. So even though they're on methadone, they actually are more sensitive to pain. Now, interestingly though, the patients on methadone don't have any difference in electrical pain tests or just pressure tests from like a clothespin or something. So interestingly, you're super sensitive to cold. Why that is, I have no idea. So just in general, opioid induced hyperalgesia the treatment is get them off the opiates but it's a real hard problem because people are both psychologically and physically dependent on the opiates so they have to go through that withdrawal which is a disaster so it's very hard to deal with this sort of thing we saw it the other day right so it's, it's a serious problem and it's even more and more and more common because our opiate use has dramatically increased over the last 10 years so it's a big societal problem. So I don't know, I, I thought all these things, is, these are physicians, is I thought all these things is like can help us as physicians. So that's it. So any questions about, I know I talked a lot today, it wasn't like too interactive, but, but I had a lot of ground to cover, I wanted to cover. 
So any questions about anything? About opiates? About low back pain? About how to deal with it? That's it? All right. Thanks, guys. Thanks. See, Thank you. You're welcome. See you next month.